All right, welcome back, everybody. My name is Hunter Bennett Daggett. This session is 3C, Construction and Alternative Delivery. Our first speakers in this session are Dennis Sanchegrin, Dr. Anna Pridmore, and Joseph Willich. Dennis Sanchegrin is a Senior Vice President for Pullman. He has over 30 years of experience in the repair and restoration of existing structures, including corrosion mitigation, structural strengthening, post-tension repair, and facade restoration. He has experience teaching integrated product delivery systems and how to procure them to small groups of owners. Dennis has a BS in civil engineering from the University of Maryland and an MBA from George Mason University and is a designated design build professional with BBIA. Joe Willich leads project development for full service solutions with 39 years of experience in the construction market, building water and wastewater treatment plants and infrastructure projects across the US. Joe is a member of the BBIA, including the National Level Water Wastewater Committee and co-chair for the Rocky Mountain Region Water Wastewater Committee. Joe has significant experience with large projects from traditional design bid build to design build, design build operate, construction manager at risk, construction excuse me, general contractor, construction manager, and turnkey projects. Dr. Anna Pridmore is the Vice President of Strategic Market Development for Structural Technologies with a focus on design build rehabilitation of civil infrastructure. She received her PhD in structural engineering, is a licensed professional engineer in California, and has over 18 years of interdisciplinary experience, specializing in large diameter pipeline asset management and renewal using advanced composites with over 400 projects implemented to date. Anna is a member of BBI a water wastewater committee and along with numerous other technical committees. Take it away. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Dennis. Um, just a quick show of hands who we have in the room here. How many owners or operators we have in the room? Come on, throw them up there. Uh, engineers or designers? Oh, a lot of designers, okay. And then any contractors? Okay, great. Um, so I'm Dennis Sanchegrin, I'm with Pullman, um, and uh, I'm gonna take you through the, the first part of the presentation. Uh, before I do, I did wanna introduce Blaine Sanchez. He's one of my colleagues. Blaine is here locally in, the, in our uh, Seattle office. So um, he'll be here for the full conference if you wanna ask any additional questions. So quick agenda, uh, we're gonna review major discussion topics, uh, give you a little bit of a project background. Um, and while this isn't specifically just all about design build, you will see design build and progressive design build really uh, interwoven throughout the presentation. And part of that is talking about the procurement strategies that are unique to design build. Um, we'll talk about contracting strategies and how they may differ on a progressive design build project versus a, a typical bid build project. Um, then some strategies around execution. And finally, if we have any time left over, we will uh, entertain some questions. Um, so discussion topics, one, we want you to understand um, how we can accelerate the procurement process with progressive design build based on these concepts, um, how to structure a dynamic design build team to address multifaceted set of challenges. And you'll see that this presentation is really about an existing uh, water mains. So working on existing structures is, uh, as you probably know, is a lot different than working on new structures. We don't get to start with a blank sheet of paper. We have to start with something that's already been built. Um, so really understanding those challenges, um, how we adapt design built to remote collaboration during procurement, which has been really unique uh, for these two projects that we're gonna present. And then risk assessment and management with limited information on 100 year old pipelines. As I said, it's all about knowing what you have. And unfortunately, good documentation is in uh, short supply. So a little bit of background on GLWA. Uh, GLWA is the Great Lakes Water Authority. It is really the uh, governing body for water uh, treatment and uh, distribution throughout the me uh, Metro Detroit area in all of Southeast Michigan. Operates five water treatment facilities, um, really uh, provides water, clean uh, water to basically 50% of Michigan and uh, provides water treatment services to about 40% of Michigan. Um, total output's about um, 1,720 MGD, and it currently is significantly underutilized. Um, so in order to meet current and future demands, 
uh, GLWA developed a plan to optimize the water system. These two projects are part of that part of that program. Um, so I'm going to give you a real quick overview, and then Joe and Anna will take you into a little bit more detail. But based on an extensive review, um, it was really determined that the Northeast Water Treatment Plant uh, was going to be decommissioned for water treatment. However, uh, the plant really was very strategic in terms of being a place for um, pumping and water distribution. So using that plant to pump water to water work park, water treatment plant, spring wells, water treatment plant, um, really re uh, required repurposing a series of water mains, which we're going to talk about uh, two of them or several of them here. Um, so there are two sets of critical water transmission mains that exist, the Seven Mile Nevada, which we'll be referring to quite a bit, and then the Garland Bewick Hurlbutt, which we call GBH, primarily because no one wants to say Hurlbutt. I don't know what that means. <laughs> All right, so what are some of the challenges? Well, the biggest challenge is these are 100-year-old pipelines, and God only knows how they were built. So uh, understanding what we had was a big, big challenge. And part of the reason, probably one of the main reasons that the owner chose to go with progressive design build, really insufficient as-built documentation, uh, completely unknown pipe geometry. We had some idea, but unknown pipe geometries and conditions. Um, and then the, val the valve operations were really unknown as well. Uh, the condition of those were unknown. And you could kind of see uh, the, does this have a pointer on it? You kind of see the, the uh, geometry there of how they're laid out. The, uh, the Northeast and the water, uh, the WWP are, are basically there on the right-hand side. Um, the areas that we're working on in orange, seven mile, uh, GBH is in the blue. Um, Um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Joe. He's going to take you through a little bit more of the background of the specific project. Thank you, Dennis. So uh, my name is Joe Willich with Brown and Caldwell. Some uh, some details here. Uh, so we'll start with the Garland, Bewick, and Hurlbut water treatment mains. These are three parallel mains, three uh, streets, and about 28,000 feet of it varies from 42 to 48 inch uh, pipeline. It's all cast iron. Uh, we've recently seen some coupons cut out from some nearby pipelines and they're about an inch and a half thick. So these are some really meaty pipes and actually look like they're in pretty good condition, uh, except probably about a quarter of the joints leak. So ne nevertheless, uh, Liwa has taken a hard look at this and this was gonna be a similar comment for Seven Mile and said, you know what? They've served uh, well beyond their intended service life. We wanna renew these pipelines, they're valuable assets to us. Uh, and we wanna do a AWWA class four renewal. Uh, and what that means is it's a fully structural renewal. So after the uh, liner system is put in, whatever is chosen has to stand on its own, uh, can't rely on the host pipe going forward. So uh, all these pipes are assumed to be fully deteriorated for the purposes of this project, even though they're not. Uh, and, and so also with, uh, I'll say GBH for short, we're also gonna install about 6,000 feet of new pipeline that varies from 60 to 69 inch. And again, keep, keep in mind, uh, these mains are being changed from just local distribution mains to taking water up to the Northeast water treatment plant area. So it's gonna pump water from Waterworks Park, another big water treatment plant up to, up to the Northeast. Uh, so kind of a highway uh, for water transmission mains. The Seven Mile Nevada, as we call it, uh, we got about 39,000 feet of 48 inch pipe to rehabilitate. Uh, this is a combination of lock bar pipe uh, and riveted steel pipe. So this is built in the 20s. We really don't know much about the steel pipe. We're not even sure the thickness of the steel pipe right now. It is mortar line, so we can't really see much. Uh, same deal, class four renewal. Uh, this one has some sensitive hydraulics on it. So we're gonna be limited probably to uh, not use, not taking away more than four inches of internal diameter. So moving on to discussion topic number one, we wanna talk about how the procurement process was accelerated using pro progressive design build based on concepts, there was no design. Uh, so this is strictly a concepts uh, approach. And just laying out some of the key objectives, can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Uh, 
Gliwa prides itself on high quality water supply. So they still have to maintain a reliable finished water. We talked about the class four. Uh, we've got to have minimal disruptions. The GBH project site is almost all residential. This is a very old part of Detroit, very narrow streets, mostly one way streets, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, so very tricky to get in there and work and, and uh, keep all the residents uh, with access to their property. So a lot of logistics to work out on this. Uh, seven miles, mostly residential, though some, uh, some busy streets, some commercial areas to deal with as well too. Bottom line is we can't under, uh, interrupt the water supply. Um, as Dennis mentioned, documentation of these pipelines is pretty thin. Uh, we're pretty sure what streets they're in. and. Uh, uh, to a certain extent, we're not sure of the height. Uh, we know work's been done on them over all these decades. So uh, very little information about repairs, for example. So, so uh, a lot to be investigated. Uh, talked a little bit about the hydraulic requirements and then uh, really about being a good neighbor here and working with the regulatory agencies. So we're gonna talk about procuring design build services uh, and I'm gonna hand it over to Anna. Right, thank you, Joe, appreciate that. So as we're talking through procuring the design build services, uh, a, a couple of the, everybody can hear me okay? We're good? Awesome. A couple of the key aspects we wanted to take into account is uh, this area, especially for, well, both Seven Mile Nevada and GBH was an urban environment. Uh, depending on the locations, for example, along Seven Mile, there's different residential zones, there's different uh, uh, highly commercial zones, there's uh, bus depots, uh, there's an area where it goes directly under a large highway. And so how to be able to navigate this ur urban environment with minimal impact to the, to the residents. So the whole reason they were looking for doing a lining renewal of the piping, as opposed to 100% replacement, is to try to minimize the impact on the surrounding community. It was also important to understand the condition, excuse me, the, the alignment of the piping because they knew generally the location, it runs along the street, but whether it runs on the north side versus the south side, that information wasn't fully known. It was important also to be able to validate lining feasibility. So we came in with an open mind as part of the process. So progressive design build, we are not upfront establishing the lining technology. Part of the progressive design build will determine which lining technology is selected for different regions of the pipe. And then also coordination of the, sh of the shutdown of the line. They had a number of laterals on this connection. It's a change of use for the piping where it used to have a, a significant number of lateral connections because it was part of uh, Detroit Water and Sewer Department's piping. And now it's being changed to being a transmission only main. So a number of the laterals had to be abandoned and had to work through that process and coordinate with each stakeholder to confirm that each a lateral that's being disconnected doesn't negatively impact the potential flows. And all of this had to be done in a way that ensured that as we head towards the design build methodology, everyone was informed in the decision making process. So one of the important things as you navigate a design build is how do we best manage all the risks. So one of the risks that came up as part of the project was identifying all of the, the relevant stakeholders so that we're in, minimizing impact to those residents. So some of the risks we had to consider was what about if there's a stakeholder we haven't yet identified or that we have misalignment between the stakeholders and our design uh, on our design approach. Uh, potential community impacts uh, or disruptions and then making sure that we minimize potential for public relations issues. The way our design build approach was able to help facilitate those is as part of the upfront process, we included in there uh, community outreach and stakeholder, uh, stakeholder mapping. So went through the entire alignment and identified all the stakeholders in the project. So that as we're selecting renewal technologies, we understand uh, what, what the different impacts may be on the project. We also did some proactive engagements. So before we even continued with our inspection phase, we already reached out uh, within Great Lakes Water Authority in the Detroit area, there's what's called departments of neighborhoods. So each individual area, they're called the Dons. You gotta make sure all the Dons are happy before you move along. So each one of the Dons had to be uh, communicated with to make sure before we headed into their neighborhood to begin any inspections, they were aware of what they would uh, expect and uh, so that there was no, no surprises upon the start of the project. We 
did early communication with them. And then we also assessed the locations of different pit locations to minimize that community footprint. Next aspect in terms of as we're procuring and moving forward this project was understanding the geometry and the alignment. As Dennis mentioned, this pipe is uh, in the order of about 100 years old and the exact alignment was uh, unknown. A good portion of the piping for Seven Mile Nevada was what's known as riveted steel and lock bar. So it's this interesting style pipe where it looks like, a, like an ice cream cone. So the pipe on one side is about a couple inches smaller than the pipe on the other side. So they basically take like a piece of paper but, uh, in the steel and they make a cone out of it. And then they put this into the next, into the next. And each one of those endpoints are riveted and lock barred together. So if you think about that, as you're navigating different lining technologies, some of the lining providers tapped out on that project. So um, there are certain lining systems that are being considered for Garland Hurlbut Buick project, which are not being considered for Seven Mile Nevada because of that unique geometry. There was also a higher level of ovality present. So the pipe itself was not round for the set for the lock bar and the riveted steel. Whereas for the cast iron, what we've seen so far is we're expecting it to be much more round as we're moving through inspections. So those unknown conditions, some of the things that we built into the design build process is we had some allowances within our inspection process to account for valve leakage or hazardous material mitigation so that those costs were best managed and allocating the risk in an appropriate manner for all parties. So we're not unduly placing risk on one part or the other. So that was a really helpful process. We also included dewatering of the pipe, debris removal, and any cleaning necessary. And then also considered um, the concept of procuring some of the valves up front earlier in the process. One of the aspects we've identified as part of the project, um, Joe, maybe you can talk to, to the, the level of lead time for some of the valves lately on other projects. Oh, 18 months is pretty typical. Right, so if you wanna start construction and it's go time and now everybody says, okay, it's ready to go. We'll get back to you in 18 months. So. <laughs> Uh, that's the kind of thing that we're working through as part of the design build approach, which gives us that flexibility to have those conversations in a way that couldn't happen in more of a conventional design bid build. Some other aspects that we considered from a strategy standpoint is uh, really digging into uh, what, what technologies were feasible. As we mentioned, there's different utility conflicts, uh, potential for community disruptions, making sure to address operations and maintenance issues. And so we took all of these aspects into account, and then we uh, have been working through a process of uh, collaborating with the owner and then map mapping out all of the different unique areas along the line um, as part of the process. Joe, your team has been heavily involved in this. You want to want to talk a little bit about this process? About the inspection? Sure. Yeah, well, it's been tricky is uh, how do you go in and inspect these pipes, uh, you know, for the Seven Mile Nevada? We wound up taking the approach of, you know, what's going to be better to drain the pipe. Uh, we had a lot of unknown geometry and, and came forward with, uh, you're looking at this uh, Rotus crawler that we actually drove through the pipe that could, one, do laser profilimetry. It, it could also do CCTV and, and, and it attempted to do IMU to basically uh, plot the XYZ of this. Uh, the, the laser data was fantastic. We, as Anna mentioned, found out pipe's not round anymore, it's oval. Uh, and a 48 inch pipe is probably a um, 46 inch tall pipe now in, in, in a lot of cases, which is very informative on how you're gonna come up with a liner approach to the project. So th this was probably the most uh, difficult pipe to inspect, mortar lined, uh, but we did get a great view of uh, uh, all the bumps, if you will, at every joint. We got a, got a great view of all the lock bar pipe, which protrudes into the pipeline. Uh, so all this uh, data helps us say, okay, how can we reline this uh, yeah. complex? I think another aspect that was a, a win of the design build process is we started out originally with one approach for how we're capturing the XYZ along the alignment. And we realized that based on a little bit of water in the pipe and uh, some of the, as he mentioned, the humps and bumps in the bottom, a, a more conventional IMU was struggling to get consistent data sets. And so it, the, the data had a lot of uh, walk in the data. Um, because of uh, navigating through the piping. So instead we ended up uh, shifting our approach to looking at more conventional survey techniques. So we had a conventional survey team that went inside the pipe and took measurements on a consistent basis along the alignment. So I think about every 15 feet, we're taking a direct XYZ measurement 
So we're building these excellent little maps inside the pipe along the full alignment, which gives us the type of information coupled with the uh, laser propylometry and coupled with the visual data that we captured as well. So the, the other aspect uh, in terms of some of the strategies that we navigated was some of the risks associated with shutdown timelines. One of the other things that we've been discussing and where it's, it's really beneficial as we're, we're navigating the design build, there's, there's three concurrent design builds that GLWA has. Two projects, the Seven Mile Nevada and the GBH that, uh, that our team is involved with. And then a third project uh, by a different company, but with close coordination. One of the challenges you, you can't literally take all three of those piping out of, out of service at the same time frame. So it's very important as we discuss shutdown timing that we're rerunning the hydraulic modeling uh, with, with GLWA collaboration. So the right level of water flow is consistent throughout the construction phase of the project. We've also discussed at length about some of the tie-in details. So uh, Joe, if maybe you can talk a little bit of some, some of the, the coordination we've had back and forth in terms of that, both with our project and, and the one upstream for us. Sure. So uh, uh, the valves have been tricky. I, I mean, we've even learned through the inspection projects which ones actually closed and which ones didn't. Uh, uh, we, we've also learned a lot about where the valves are located. You know, we're talking about valves here, folks, from some of these go back to the late 1800s uh, on, on the laterals, um, and, and some are frozen open. Uh, and, and then trying to come up with how do we blind flange some of these uh, laterals off? How do we uh, we're, we're actually going to reduce the number of inline valves. We don't need as many for, for the water transmission main, and then how we're going to line right through some of these valves. Uh, so, so we're not going to remove them. We're not going to replace them. We're going to put a liner straight through, especially some of these inline valves. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so that's part of the, the coordination. And one of the aspects, especially as we're transitioning from this uh, more of a distribution system to the transmission line, there's a number of locations that we're just abandoning valves. And so that, that's a way to be able to provide some cost savings for the project and minimize future maintenance, as, as Joe mentioned. And what you see here is what's there, that these, these are mostly brick, uh, brick vaults. Exactly, so, so this is one of the projects, uh, one of the, the vault structures from our project. Some beautiful craftsmen, <laughs> great craftsmanship, but uh, they begin to show their wear after about a hundred years. So, so this is an important aspect of the project that I think, um, especially if we noticed there's about 30% owners around uh, the rest are mostly consultants in the room, but, but how do you actually, what was the logistics that GLWA went through as part of their procurement strategy? So one of the aspects that they did for this project is they did it with a uh, weighted evaluation. As you can see here, the project was uh, just about half technical work plan. So there was a 50 page requirement for each project for, for the proposal um, that, uh, that was, assigning uh, for the, the technical work plan, as well as having pages for the experience qualifications and key team members. And so um, based on that selection criteria, they then chose to negotiate with the top weighted score. So the decision to move forward was based on work plan experience quals and team members. And then there was a commercial discussion just with the, the highest uh, performing team. And as you can see that the major proposal evaluation criteria was the technical work plan, really evaluating previous experience of this type of projects. And one of the things they were looking for is they didn't want it to have a company come in and just try to sell them, here's our technology widget, this is what you should do. They really wanted to have us come in and, and come in with an open mind so that we're considering all the possible technologies that could be applicable for this project so that they truly are getting the best of the progressive design build approach. And then also built on a previous working relationship and, and history, which is a, a key DBIA best practice. Okay, so in terms of the technical work plan, some of the aspects that it included was an understanding of the project overall, how the project would move forward in terms of the proposed work plan, what design criteria, Joe mentioned about the class four renewal, uh, minimal hydraulic impact, things like that, and then how we're minimizing disruption to the, to the residents. Uh, there was also about what, what we, do we plan to do to accomplish X, Y, Z, as well as understanding the existing condition of the pipeline. We also needed to provide a schedule, so making sure that we can meet all the key milestones for the project, what our assumptions are, and how we're going to navigate through conflict, and uh, making sure that there's always situations on a project where we need to make sure that we're all course corrected, and the more that you have the appropriate approach to that, the better. So next up, um, I think, 
Open it wherever you want. Okay. Yeah. So in terms of stru structuring this team, um, the next approach that we're looking at right here, next slide. You can see here from the schedule um, that the first part one, so approximately the first three years on the project, is all entailed with the phase one activities. So that involves the inspection of the align uh, of the alignment, and then going through options evaluation, selection of the different lining technologies, uh, placement of all the valves and the vaults throughout the full alignment, selection of the final locations for each dig pits, all of those aspects, finalizing a full set of hundred percent drawings. And, uh, and then proceeding forward with phase two implementation. And then as you can see here, between 36 and 84 months was the schedule for the uh, moving forward. One little nuance that we think provided value to, the, to both teams is the initial conversations all started out looking at this as a GMP, so guaranteed maximum price for phase two. But based on GLWA had a preference to minimize the amount of paperwork necessary with a typical GMP, um, they want us to show all our homework, show all our math, but then come to a final negotiated lump sum. So it makes it easier and takes off some of the burden for having to, um, to work our way, you know, TMP, uh, time and materials up to that final GMP. So, so that was a, a, a savings that helped minimize some effort on their part. So next up, uh, Dennis will talk about how we established a selection of the design partner, which uh, BC is our design partner, and how we move forward with our team. Great. Thank you. Um... So successful design build, it's really all about having a good team. And without a good team, you might as well just go traditional bid build, low bid. Um, because um, with a good team, these projects can be really fun. They can be really successful. Um, so we, we really take that seriously. Uh, DBIA best practices suggest that as well. Um, so I'll take you through some of those strategies. Um, in one, in establishing a design partner, we think we have one of the best. Um, and really went through interview and qualifications based selection of the designer by the design builder. So um, that was a, a pretty big team within Pullman and structural technologies. And we kind of kind of already knew who we wanted to take to the dance, but um, went through a, a process of really making sure that we were aligned in terms of, you know, what we wanted to achieve and uh, where we wanted to go with this project. Uh, we did put in place uh, formal teaming agreements. Um, making that an exclusive relationship between you know Pullman structural technologies and Brown and Caldwell um, also provided some compensation for the proposal development expenses which um, if anybody's put together a progressive design bill proposal I can tell you it's not a small fee there's a lot of work that goes into that and uh, the quality of the proposal really is a big part of the you know selection criteria so if you're going to spend some money that's the place to spend it um, we also had a success fee built in um, upon phase one award, uh, which we obviously have won, and then a success fee for phase two award, which is still out there. And that really aligns the, all the team members to make sure that um, we're all going for the same thing, which is this is not just an inspection project, right? This is an inspection project that leads to a construction project. And uh, we all need to be aligned to that as well, um, making sure that we don't turn this into a science project, we turn this into something that's actionable, usable, and uh, will be successful for the owner. Um, we also had a detailed scope of work breakout, I'll talk about in a second, and a list of key personnel. And uh, we, we kind of inter, um, intertwined some DBI best practices throughout this presentation. Um, and I won't read all of these to you, but basically it says, make sure you have a really good relationship with your designer. <laughs> so, um, so establishing sub-consultants and um, I'll let Joe talk on this in a second, but you know, obviously the strength of the of the design team, the inspection design team is only as good as its team members as well. So um, underneath structural technologies, you can see some of the, the sub consultants that we had there. Um, and Brown and Caldwell is our engineer of record. Do you guys want to speak on that at all in terms of the sub consultant selection? Well, you're, you're right, Dennis. I mean, it takes a big team uh, to take on a project like this. And you've got to figure out who are the right players, who's got the right skill sets. This is the final list you see here. Uh, I've actually lost track of how many companies we actually talked to during the process to put this team together and this proposal together. We probably talked to 20 companies, maybe maybe more than that, uh, really interviewing all these firms so we could come up with really what we thought was the, was the best in class team here to offer up to this client. 
Yeah, and, and I think it's got a really nice mix of having uh, some companies that are the, uh, the the best in class from from national players, as well as having uh, those that have local experience. So, for example, uh, Wade Trim provided the surveying for the project, and NTH the geotechnical and uh, hazardous material sampling. Those are both areas that is really important to have a local footprint because of understanding on previous projects and and that kind of uh, history. Whereas Simpson, Gumpertson, Hager who is doing the liner design for the project is a nationally recognized expert where the uh, geographical location wasn't as important. So we really put the thought and intention into that of how we selected each partner. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Anna. You know, I'm gonna, uh, while we're a national company and we kind of cover the whole country, I'm gonna write a book one day called, uh, It's Different Here, because <laughs> it's different everywhere. Everyone believes it's different here, but it's, it's so true. And in Detroit, it's no different than anywhere else. They're gonna say, hey, to, do, to be successful in Detroit, you gotta be from Detroit, right? Um, and so it was really important that we had people that really understood the community, understood uh, how to get things done um, because it is different here. Um, scope breakout. So this is one of the things, um, uh, thank God we have Anna on our team because um, you know this is something that typically people do after they get the job. This is something we did before we got the job. I think there are what, 400 different scope items um, that were identified and each scope item was, um, was broken out. We identified you know, who was responsible, defined roles and responsibilities for these individual tasks, um, identified a lead and a supporting role for each one, um, included quantities, any, any assumptions that were made. And then uh, those, that schedule of values or that scope breakout was uh, translated directly to schedule of values for each subcontractor or subconsultant. Um, this, really allowed us everybody to have visibility to what each part of the team was doing so there wasn't a lot of overlap and the what and probably more importantly there wasn't you know uh, gaps in terms of things that were missing um, so this has been a kind of a go-to document for the team uh somewhat of our our bible and anna's the keeper and make sure that it, it goes straight <laughs> yeah. um some other things uh, in terms of the uh, prime contract as design builder, you know, DBIA best practices says the contract should have clear commercially appropriate flow down of obligations from the prime design build project. Um, I think we all understand what flow down means and how important that is, but in a progressive design build project, it's really important uh, that we make sure that we identify what those, those flow down provisions are and that everybody on the team is aware of their responsibilities. Um, so after the design build team selection, um, you know, GLWA scheduled prime contract scope negotiations with the design builder, which is uh, Pullman, uh, collaboration between the entire design build team. Everybody's been involved in those meetings, uh, draft prime contract language and uh, distribute that prime contract language to subs. I can't tell I, we are a subcontractor a lot. And I can't tell you the number of times I say, oh, I have this flow down provision in my contract. Um, can I see the prime contract? And they're like, yeah, I'll get to you in like 60 to 90 business days because they don't, either they don't have it or they don't wanna share it or they don't understand it. This is something that we really, I think is really important that everybody understands what their responsibilities are. Um, and then, you know, fo have follow-up sessions with individual subs to make sure that, you know, we can discuss any of their concerns, things that they, maybe they have missed, they didn't think about, or um, maybe there's some overlap, like I said earlier. And then address any any concerns addressed with GLWA prior to finalizing the prime contract. So this was not a situation where Pullman signed a contract and then shoved it down everybody's throat. It was really, hey, let's all look at this contract. Let's we're all in it together. We're all agreeing to this. So let's make sure that we uh, go down that path. I'm way out of time here. Sorry. Um, so I'm going to uh, pass it along, and he's going to cover the next six slides in one minute. <laughs> go, Joe. <laughs> Talk that fast. Um, so, really, the purpose of what we're showing you here is uh, uh, Gliwa wanted a lump sum. So, we've told you about all these unknowns, and, and uh, we really don't know what we have, and go investigate and do a design. In this case, they want to go to 100% design. Uh, so, we did, we gave them a lump sum. But what's different here, and what's important, and it's a great takeaway, is they used allowances. Uh, the owner basically said, look, we know we've got a lot of unknowns. We know you're probably gonna come up against uh, issues and topics that nobody's really thought through and created uh, allowances six through 10 here. Uh, it was a multi-million dollar pot of money. Uh, 
to work with those unknowns. So as you encounter those, come to us, let's talk about it and we'll, we'll give you a change order. We don't have to go back to our board and get permission or any of those long, uh, long process steps. Hey Joe, one item that's kind of an important one here is that they actually only had tasks uh, one through nine originally. As part of negotiation, what was really nice is that GLWA was flexible in realizing we saw tremendous risk in how much the dewatering, debris removal and cleaning could take. It was millions of dollars more for the potential allowance than they'd originally had budgeted. So they said, hey, we get it, no problem. Put it in a separate allowance and we'll, we'll use it if we need it. So, so that allowed both of us to manage our risks appropriately. So it's not added project costs unless we need it. And if it is, everybody's uh, basis is covered. Thanks. So uh, the next topic we're going to talk about, of course, we did this all during COVID uh, through this procurement. So we're going to talk about remote collaboration during procurement. Uh, I'm going to cover some of these pretty quickly. Our, our team took the time and effort and sat down, came up with our mission statement between the parties. We came up with critical success factors to help guide us. And then we use that to help understand everybody's roles and responsibilities. You saw we had a pretty extensive team here. After project award, we actually did this with Great Lakes Water Authority as well. We sat down, went through this exact process with them. We spent, uh, we got the note here about reviewing the project schedule. We took the time to say, we got a lot we got to get done in the first six months of this project. Let's take the time, make sure everybody understands every detail of what we got to do here so we can work as a, a very coordinated team. Um, communication process, some, uh, you can see the items we've got here. I'm going to leave it as, there's a lot of ways to communicate. Some, some ways, there's too many ways to communicate. Uh, and, and what I encourage everyone is create a communication plan. Decide how you want to communicate uh, uh, and stick to it. Create that discipline with your team and, and you're going to find that works a lot better for you And then it's, instead of trying to take advantage of every uh, communication forum out there. Um, more on communication, uh, we came up with project execution meetings. Uh, you, you know how these projects go. We all have a lot of meetings. So we came up with a system for how we're gonna conduct meetings and when, who's, who's gonna attend those meetings. And again, created a discipline around that. We did use uh, Procore as, as our uh, document uh, system, uh, which has worked very well. So got everybody up to speed on that and, and have been deploying that. Number four, we're gonna talk a little bit about risk management here. Again, 100 year old pipelines. Um, and, and so we actually came up with, this is not, not necessarily new, but we came up with a risk register approach. So we sat down and said, with our broader team of, what are all the risks on this project? Let's identify the risks. Uh, and you know what, once you identify the risks, you start thinking about, well, what's the odds of that happening? And uh, if it does happen, how much is it gonna cost us? So we, we put together a, uh, a cost-based risk register so we could sum up what we thought all the costs were. Not perfect at all, but just an initial indicator of potential cost. And then we said, okay, well, we've identified these risks. Let's come up with mitigation strategies. And the idea is when we realize risks and some of these risks will be realized, it's not a brand new surprise. Hopefully we've thought about it. Hopefully we've got some ideas on how to deal with those risks. Uh, and, and the team would be better prepared for that. And a little snapshot of our risk register, that's probably 400 lines long too. Um, but just to give you an idea, and, and we use some stoplight uh, color coding in here too, to come up with, uh, you know, if we got a red, yellow uh, risk or a red risk, uh, just to heighten everybody's awareness about uh, the different risk topics that we discovered or, or we identified and discovered and came up with mitigation with talking fast because I know we're out of time. That was it. We got like 30 seconds for questions. One question. Does someone have a really great question? Yes, sir. We'll also be around afterwards, so happy to answer more. What was the funding source for the project? So uh, Great Lakes Water Authority on the first uh, project, Seven Mile Nevada, are, are basically uh, using their own money, their own capital funding. The second project, uh, GBH, they actually did apply for some, uh, from the state of Michigan, drinking water revolving fund money. Uh, so they're using dwarf um, money, so they're using some dwarf money as well too. And they got a low interest loan for that. So interesting mix. 
Thank you all for coming today. We'll be around if there's further questions. Thank you. Appreciate y'all coming.